So we have many things to do and we cannot wait too much. Okay. So everything should be working now. And uh, so this is the schedule for this week. Uh, soon this afternoon I will publish it the, the schedule for next week, but that, that's a normal schedule, okay? So we will have lecture on uh, Monday and, fr and um, Tuesday next week. While this week, Tuesday, you know, it's a national holiday, so the Polytechnic is closed, no lecture, okay? But tomorrow there will be lab as usual, okay, in room uh, uh, 10i, and you finish working with uh, JavaScript inside the browser directly, okay? So you're programming directly in JavaScript uh, within the browser, working a little bit with the fetch and experimenting a very simple case of cross-site scripting, actually the same as we saw last time in the, in the, during the lecture, okay? And from today, we will start talking about, uh, let's say, the main topic of this course. Uh, that is actually React. React basically is a JavaScript library developed by a very well-known uh, company, which is actually Facebook, okay? A former Facebook, now Meta. That is aimed to simplify how we develop JavaScript code in the client, okay? In the browser. So, well, th this image, I, I know you, you liked it, uh, I, you took some pictures, right? So it's from my colleagues in the same class in, you know, in the Italian and English course in computer engineering, not in cybersecurity, but we, we like it because uh, basically it says uh, we, we've done a lot of things until now in a certain way in JavaScript programming within the browser, and now we start to understand, uh, to, to try to do these things in, in a slightly different way, okay? So uh, not really everything you know is wrong, many things you know are right, okay, luckily. But uh, we will need to adapt a little bit to this library, to the React library, to understand how it works. And how, especially, it can simplify things for us for programming within the browser, okay? So because until you program, uh, uh, you know, very simple examples like we do sometimes in the lab and du especially during the lectures where I don't have too much time, everything is simple. You know, you do a few JavaScript calls and that's fine. JavaScript functions and that's fine. But when you start growing a bigger and bigger application, things get complicated very quickly. So you need to have a, a good way of developing your application. And that's exactly what we are going to do with this uh, 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 React-based approach, okay? Why we choose the React? Well, the answer is very simple. It's very, very popular. It's uh, quite simple in, I mean, the principles guiding the development are quite simple. Uh, and um, uh, it's uh, being actively maintained. There's a very, very big company behind it. I, I told you, Meta, okay? That's uh, the, the, the company behind it. But it's not prop proprietary software. It's open source software with a quite permissive license, so you're not limited by what Meta thinks to do with this library. You always have the possibility to do whatever you want with your library, and they don't restrict uh, or require anything from you by using the library, okay? That's a very important point to consider when choosing some, some library or framework in which you would like to develop, okay? Um, okay, so first of all, why should we use a library? We, we didn't use a library until now. You went to the lab, and I did it in the lectures. We used the JavaScript uh, APIs uh, that are present in the browser. So document, get element by ID, create element, append child, and stuff like that. So actually, there's no real need for using a library in the browser. A library, as usual, as any other library, is supposed to simplify how we work with the code, okay? So we should write less code, code that is more intuitive, more readable, and so on. So the library should have this aim, okay? And React is a good uh, compromise uh, between these uh, requirements, okay? So uh, it actually simplifies the browser environment because uh, it has uniform DOM methods. What does it mean? Well, we didn't see every a a DOM API within the browser, but sometimes uh, they are not really 
as you expect. There are many quirks, uh, many places in which uh, things need to be done a little bit different depending on the element you have in the page and so on, especially with forms, which are the way in which you interact with the, cl with the user. Okay? The library simplifies this uh, situation and provides you a uniform interface regardless of what you are using within your application the elements, the native uh, DOM elements, your components, and whatever we will talk about uh, uh, later, okay? Um, it forces you to use a very uh, 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 explicit hierarchy of elements, okay? So every tag should be opened and closed and correctly nested and so on, which is not always true in HTML because the browsers are quite uh, permissive in what they can parse within, with the HTML. You can also define higher level components uh, than HTML element. This is very another very, very important point. Uh, you, when you develop programs in general, you would like to abstract some functionalities in your, of your program and encapsulate them typically into functions or objects if you have object-oriented programming languages. Here, that's the same. You would like to develop a part of the page, like the part that you know, shows a list, allows you to pick a, a date in a calendar, uh, you know, f shows the, the, the cart when you're buying something or, um, you know, al uh, allows you to compose an email, whatever you think in terms of your application. And you would like to have this component which is reusable in other applications, in other places, okay? And a library like this, like React, allows you to create these higher level components, okay? Um, and also simplify some tasks that we need to um, perform within the browser, in particular processing of events, typically user interaction, you know, the clicks uh, and the user that fill up uh, in information within forms, text uh, and stuff like that, okay? And also the updates, that's another important point, that's uh, probably one of the most important points uh, that we need to uh, uh, understand for a, a, a JavaScript framework, how the update works when you have data that changes, okay? So you have a list of uh, films to show in the lab, right? So your list of films changes, somebody needs to update the interface. So change the list that is displayed within the window of the browser. And you can do it yourself, as we did in the lab until now. So basically we said we delete everything and we reconstruct the list from scratch, or you should go and update what is changed, okay? This is a quite difficult task to implement, okay? Unless you would like to have a really inefficient implementation, actually like the one we, we used in the lecture. So we delete everything and we can reconstruct everything from scratch. But if the application is complex, just, you know, reconstructing everything because just one single bit, one single uh, element in the page has changed is quite uh, heavy from the point of view of execution of the code for the browser and in general from, you know, the capacity of the browser to interact effectively with the user because uh, this process can be slow, okay? You don't want to interact with low applications. You know, we always know that it is, uh, let's say, frustrating interacting with slow applications, okay? So this is uh, the good part, <laughs> okay? But, uh, uh, you know, to achieve the, these uh, goals, which are very interesting from the point of view of developing a, a JavaScript application, uh, we need to adhere to some, uh, um, um, uh, let's say, patterns, programming patterns that the library requires us to follow, okay? So, in short, we cannot program as we like. We need to follow the way in which React expects us to program the application. So, there are predefined programming patterns and application architectures that we will need to follow. And we will discuss, of course, all these patterns in the next lectures, and starting from today. But the good thing is that since, you know, this library is so widespread around, there are a lot of compatible plugins, extensions, components, uh, 
um, you know, other developers that develop the code that you can reuse and adapt for your case and so on. So, and, and since we would like to support this higher level component, it should be easy to integrate this code into your application, okay? Um, there's another point that we need to uh, care about that is the, the state management of the application. What's the state for the application? We will come back to this point a lot of times because uh, it's very important how uh, React and in general JavaScript frameworks handle state, but what's the state of your application? Well, actually it's the data that is currently processed by your application. So for instance, for the lab, that's a list of the films uh, and other minor state like uh, uh, the way in which it's presented, it is sorted, sorted by a certain column and so on, which filter is selected and stuff like that. So the state that defines how your application should appear at a certain moment. That includes the data that are shown and other presentation states that tells you, you know, which button is pressed, which filter is selected, and stuff like that. But we will come back to all this point. This is just an introduction, okay? So there are a lot of resources here. You can find some, but uh, I mean, feel free to browse around in the internet, uh, and there's plenty of, uh, of code and stuff uh, from which you can, um, you know, uh, find uh, inspiration, I would say, okay? Uh, that's the official stuff, the official guide, of course, and, uh, but there's plenty of other stuff. There are also uh, plugins for the browser development tools. Now we are familiar you know, with the browser development tools, uh, which are basically the console, the inspector, and the network tab, tab for the moment. Okay? So that shows us uh, the HTML content, the JavaScript console, and what is happening between the client and the server. And they developed, the, the React developers developed this extension, both for Chrome and Firefox. Um, you can find them in the stores, and now we will install them, okay? Um, um, that allows you to inspect uh, how the React uh, library is working in your application. So, of course, you should have React working in developer mode in your application, but if you load a React application, this plugin recognizes it and shows you a lot of things uh, useful to understand how React is working, like the components, not just the HTML, but the components uh, and the properties, the state, and stuff like that. Okay? Um, so let's, let's try to you know, do that. Um, I didn't install it yet uh, on, on Firefox here, luckily, so we can try. So we just uh, search for, you know, the uh, uh, tools uh, uh, extensions, okay? React, React developer tools, just add, okay? This extension will have a lot of permission, access your data for all websites and so and, st and stuff like that. So, of course, you need to be careful about extensions, but this is, I mean, a reasonably a good extension. I think you can trust it, okay? If you were uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, a company environment, probably, you know, you should ask for authorization to install this stuff, or maybe you should use it only on uh, development computers where you basically develop your application and nothing else. You don't, uh, let's say, access to your bank account or company sensitive information and stuff like that. Because, of course, these extensions have the possibility to, you know, uh, go around within the browser and see what mm, all the things that are going on in the browser. So. Uh, checking network connection, checking the, the HTML code, uh, taking data, uh, and, and do whatever they want, okay? So they need to be trusted, okay? So in short, what happens? Uh, well, for the moment, nothing, but when we will download a, a React application, there will be an additional tab, actually, too, that allows us to show components uh, within the React application and inspect components and stuff like that. More or less like the inspector for the HTML, okay? So fine, so you see that installing the, 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 uh, this extension is very easy, okay? And so now we can uh, dive into 
uh, understanding a little bit more about the design principle that comes with uh, React, okay? There will be many things that maybe are not so clear at the moment, but of course in the next lectures, uh, starting from today, we will clarify all these aspects because we need to learn uh, very well how this uh, library React works, okay? So React has this declarative approach. So basically you're writing code that never manipulates the DOM. So you forget about, you know, create element, uh, uh, append child, uh, uh, inner HTML, and all the stuff that you have seen until now in the lab. That's why in the first slide we said, well, forget about <laughs> what, uh, what uh, you saw uh, previously, okay? You never explicitly define the order operation. You just define one simple thing, which is uh, the base, uh, uh, the basis uh, on which React is based. So for each element you would like to show, you need to sh tell React how it should appear. And the rest is managed and done by React, okay? So React should know how the component or the, the element should appear, okay? So in short, uh, basically for simple elements like HTML elements, you just write the HTML elements. And for more complex elements, like your components you would like to define, you define the HTML uh, that uh, compose this element and React will uh, take care of uh, taking this code and put it into the visualization part of the library and so show it into the browser window, okay? And uh, this operation from the code that you define to the visualization is called render, okay? That is the English term that, make, that says, uh, you know, you create something from, from, from a description, okay? Something visual, visual from the description. Okay, uh, we have a functional design approach. That means that uh, we will define this appearance in terms of functions. So each uh, component, uh, so part of a visualization will be defined as a function that takes certain parameters and it will return what is needed to be shown inside the application, okay? And every, every time something changes, it's the React's task to uh, redraw the browser window, so to update the visualization. We will never touch the visualization directly from now on until the end of the course. It's React's task to do that, okay? So differently from what you have done un until now in the lab and what you will do uh, uh, still tomorrow in, in the last lab that uh, uh, directly manipulates uh, the uh, JavaScript and the DOM uh, within the browser, okay? So from now on, using React, we will never touch the DOM directly again, okay? In the, indeed, we will have a sort of DOM okay, that we can interact with that is called virtual DOM, but we will talk about this uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so React is functional. It means that uh, a certain part of the user interface is defined as a function here that takes uh, some parameters and very simple components just takes a uh, uh, few parameters that are called properties uh, or props uh, in, the jar in, in React's uh, jargon. Um, um, and if uh, the components are more complex, they will also have an internal state, okay? A very simple component uh, that uh, just take a property can be something that decides how to show, uh, in which language you would like to show your interface, okay? Let's say that's the, um, let's say a simple button uh, that uh, uh, says, um, I don't know, uh, uh, cancel operation, okay? So you need to write something on the button. Uh, you would like to have it uh, uh, um, a, a have a component that works in many languages. So you can have a function that takes a props, so properties that says uh, which language should be shown. And within the code, you decide what to write inside the button. You either write cancel or annul, that's Italian for cancel, okay? Or whatever language you would like to choose. That's a, a simple uh, part of the user interface, simple button, but can be something more complex, can be the entire application and so on, that takes uh, some properties, and I, I gave you an example, like the language property, 
and uh, depending on the property, it renders something or something else. So, uh, a, a text in a certain language or in another language. Okay, so that's more piece of the user interface. More complex uh, uh, um, components can also have a state, so keep an internal state. Like there's a, a list of filters, like in your lab. Uh, in the list of filters, maybe you would like to keep uh, uh, the information about which filter is active. That is a state, okay? Not something that comes from outside, but it's inside the component. If we think in terms of components, then later for the lab we will think, you know, where to put the state. But uh, in, in general, uh, there's something where you can select or typically the user interacts uh, and there's uh, something that has been done previously by the user or there's an internal state like in a list of films, uh, the, the, the information about films, uh, that's a state because uh, uh, it, it decides uh, what to show for the user. It could be also a prop but uh, this, this uh, discussion will be done late, okay? So immutability, React exploits this immutability of object uh, to simplify programming, okay? Uh, of course, this is the React approach. If you take another uh, framework for JavaScript, uh, for developing JavaScript application, there can be other approaches, okay? We are just now describing how React uh, approaches the problem, okay? If you take Angular or whatever other, you know, widespread uh, uh, frameworks, uh, the approach can be different. Uh, React is uh, good in a certain sense for us because it's uh, simple enough to be easily explained and understood, but at the same time, it's quite powerful. You know, the Meta, the big company, is using it internally to develop uh, the, their interface, the, the, their applications, okay? The application facing the user, so when you interact with Facebook or, you know, this, this other, uh, uh, web applications uh, developed by that company, basically you are using React. Um, okay, so uh, in short it says that uh, the props uh, should be immutable. So the component cannot change the props, okay? What's a component? The component is the function that we saw before that takes the props and decides what to show in the user interface, okay? actually tells the React what to show in the user interface, and then the Re React will show it, okay? Um, and so we would like this function to be hidden potent and immutable. That means that when we give the same set of properties, the result should be exactly the same, okay? So if we give the same properties, the result should be exactly the same. This is to simplify the programming and simplify the implementation of React as well. So React knows that if the properties didn't change, it, there's no need to change the appearance of that uh, user interface part, the part of the user interface that is managed by that function. If the property changes, the function needs to be rerun and the user interface will probably change, okay? And also for the state, we need to be very, very careful. Uh, we need to tell that we would like to change the state. It's not just a simple variable, we assign a, a value to this variable, okay? We need to tell React that we would like to change the state of that component or that function, um, let's say function at the moment because components for us are functions. And so React takes note of this uh, desire from us as programmers, as developers, and it will update the state and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, update the user interface according to the state uh, uh, that we changed, okay? So the functions that we will use in React are just pure functions. That means they should have no side effects besides computing the return value. So they are hidden potent. Uh, so it means, as I told you before, we pass the same properties, the result should be exactly the same with no side effects. So I cannot write something internally in the function in a global variable wherever and uh, use it later because this is not idempotent anymore. If I'm not using only the properties that are passed as parameters to the function, but I'm using also something else to compute the result, it means that the function is not idempotent. 
only for these uh, properties. And that's a requirement for React, okay? And hidden potent also means they are predictable, of course, because the result is always the same. So it means that we, we, uh, we don't need to rerun the function because we, always, we already know that with that set of properties, the result is exactly what we got before, okay? So the application is made of components. Can be very simple components. So the, 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 the you know, predefined React components are basically all HTML tags, okay? So like table, like button, like uh, uh, lists and stuff like that. Also the, the, you know, the very simple one, paragraph uh, he uh, headers and stuff like that. And uh, the entire application is re-rendered every time a state or a property is changed. So React takes care of uh, controlling if properties have changed and state has changed. And if something has changed, React initiates a cycle of re-rendering of the entire application, okay? So it means that in theory, in theory, only in theory, each component will rebuild itself from scratch, okay? Depending on what we wrote in those functions, okay? But of course, if everything is rebuilt from scratch, in theory, you know, the performance would be quite worse. That's exactly what we did in the lab. We say, the, well, we destroy the list and we recreate the list. Actually, we didn't re redraw everything. We just redraw the list. Okay, reconstruct the list, actually, not re reconstruct the list. But React is managing the entire application, so it reconstructs the whole HTML content, okay? At least in theory. But you may wonder about the performance, and that's a, a very legitimate question, because modification of the DOM are expensive, especially in complex applications. Of course, if they are, uh, like in, in our example, just a few items in a list, um, not that expensive, especially with uh, powerful computers and mobile devices today, okay? And so to address this problem, React implements uh, what we call virtual DOM, which actually exists. It's a data structure within the, the React library that uh, um, um, it's very optimized and very fast to update and it's maintained by React, so we don't uh, really have to interact uh, neither with the real DOM nor with the virtual DOM because React builds the virtual DOM on the basis of the components that we are and, and the text that we say uh, that uh, should be included in our application, okay? And by the way, I mean, this virtual DOM, it also allows React to, to correct some DOM anomalies and asymmetries, as I was saying before, for instance, for forms and stuff like that. There are elements that behave a little bit different uh, one from another. Like the text area, for instance, is different from the input uh, text, uh, okay? So if you have multiple lines, uh, it's different from the single line and stuff like that. Why? Uh, because, you know, the, the forms were, uh, developed uh, more than 30 years ago and nobody was thinking about web applications. So they developed uh, the forms in this way, not completely uniform, not really uh, symmetric for all, <laughs> all the components. And we keep this uh, behavior for historical reason and to keep compatibility with the past. But if we are using a library, we can especially that virtualizes the DOM, we can virtualize all these behaviors, and so we can correct and fix these anomalies, small anomalies, okay? Uh, also for properties and also for events, okay? So there are synthetic events that are mapped to actual events uh, within the browser, okay? Click, change, and these uh, important events uh, for us. Uh, after uh, components have done this process of re-rendering, React computes the difference between the old virtual DOM and the new virtual DOM. So it, it has two copies of this data structure into the memory. Uh, one that it corresponds to which is currently shown, and another one which is what, uh, how we would like to uh, update this virtual DOM. React computes the differences, and then automatically only modification and differences between the two virtual DOMs are applied in the browser window 
Okay? So this is done completely automatically by React, and we don't have to use any function to manipulate the DOM. Okay? And so basically the efficiency is that React should be able to do this operation, so detect the differences and update only the difference with quite a good efficiency. Okay? And to have this good efficiency, we need to stick to this uh, React programming uh, uh, paradigm. Okay, so uh, do the functions in a certain way, so uh, no state, they should be idempotent, no side effects, etc. Or if they have the state, we should follow the React uh, uh, way of handling the state. Okay, so in short, uh, there's this virtual DOM. Uh, uh, a new virtual DOM is constructed, okay, because every component is re rendered in theory, okay. Uh, React makes a difference and just go into the browser DOM and updates only what is changed, okay? But this is transparent for us in the sense that we need to know that things work this way because we shouldn't break this model, okay? And not to break this model means strictly follow the React uh, guidelines on how to uh, create components, what can be done and what cannot be done in components, okay? Uh, yeah, by the way, the, the changes are batch rendered. It means that they are collected together and updated in a single pass, okay? Uh, when, so it's not like uh, we change uh, uh, something in, the, in one component and then something else immediately in another component, uh, and at each time we change something, uh, the, uh, re the re-render happens immediately, okay? That, that's a, a, a render cycle, okay? where things get uh, uh, accumulated, uh, queued, let's say, and then they are applied uh, in, in one single pass, okay, for, for uh, the, in the browser window, okay? But this is not a problem because uh, the, the queue management is quite intelligent and the user will not perceive this, uh, this uh, queuing and update, okay, if everything has been done correctly. Okay, uh, well, about the events, uh, we will talk uh, maybe about uh, uh, events when we encounter them, okay? Just, uh, they are also abstracted like uh, the uh, DOM, okay? That's the virtual DOM, and here we don't have virtual event, they call it s synthetic events, okay? Um, so, how can we fit uh, our uh, React stuff in the DOM? Well, basically, uh, React provides us to uh, uh, a certain set of functions, okay, on, on objects, okay, um, created by, you know, uh, the, 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 the function that comes with React, and we say, in short, where to attach, you know, the, uh, the DOM, the virtual DOM of React inside uh, the actual DOM of our browser. That's the only time uh, uh, at which we interact directly with the browser DOM. Actually, we, we will never write this code because we will always start from a template that already does it for us, okay? So we will see in, in a few minutes how to create a skeleton uh, of, uh, of a React application the first React application, like the Hello World application, and you will see that, you know, the script creating the skeleton will do all this stuff for us, okay? Nice thing is that uh, um, we are used to write HTML code and not, uh, you know, a lot of functions, you know, to define uh, um, HTML components. You try it in the lab, right? Uh, create element, append child, and all this stuff. This is very, very boring, also error prone, because we might forget to append, to you know, create something, create something correctly, and stuff like that. So for React, they invented this uh, JSX syntax. That means that we can specify components, uh, that means uh, parts of HTML code, something that can, uh, needs to be shown in the user interface, through actually uh, um, HTML-like code, okay? So we can write the code uh, in HTML-like fashion, 
And this will be converted into React calls for functions that are needed by React to create these elements, etc., automatically for us. We just need to stick to this uh, syntax uh, that we will learn uh, basically today and we will keep it uh, for the rest of the course. Okay? But the syntax, as you see, is very simple. It's basically the same as HTML. There will be some minor things uh, uh, where we need to pay attention, like how to specify values in the attributes and stuff like that. Okay? But uh, this, is very, this is equivalent, and the transformation from the left side to the right uh, side that is actually calling the correct React function to create elements, etc., in the virtual DOM, is done automatically, completely automatically for us, okay? By a set of libraries that basically comes with uh, React, okay? Uh, so this operation is called uh, transpiling, so it's uh, just a transformation, automatic transformation from uh, one, let's say, language uh, syntax structure to another, okay? Uh, why it is called JSX? Just a curiosity. X means XML, okay? XML, uh, that is a markup language, more or less like HTML, but it's more formally defined. We cannot leave uh, text open and everything should be nested correctly and stuff like that. And JS, of course, comes from JavaScript. So it's a kind of a mix between JavaScript and XML. So in some places we can insert J JavaScript code even it's, if it's uh, XML. Okay, with the text and etc., which have the same name as uh, HTML, or the, we'll have the name of the component, the new component that we will define. Okay, so in short, a page is just a set of components. Components can be predefined by React, so exactly equivalent to the HTML uh, uh, elements, or can be created by us when we would like to abstract a set of text, HTML text, in something more, uh, let's say, uh, manageable, okay? Like we do with functions uh, in normal code, when we program, let's say, normal code, and there are, there are a set of instructions that perform a, a, a given action, and we put it, them into a function. Here, we put a set of text, HTML text, into a component, and we can use the component whenever we need it, we need the, the component, okay? Think, for instance, for your lab, there are the films. Uh, every film is a row. We can create a component for the row of the film. We pass as properties uh, the values that the component should show, the title, the favorite, uh, the date, uh, whatever it's in, in the film. That's a component, and then we can use this component and call it again and again for each row. Okay? Like you do with a function. You define a function to perform some tasks, some operations, and then you call it when you need it. Okay? That's exactly the same idea. Okay? So you have, a, let's say, a component for a blog post uh, here, a component uh, with a set of links and stuff, and, you know, these are composed together to create your application. Okay? Uh, if you don't have these components, what would you, you would do? I mean, nothing, you, you should uh, encapsulate them in other higher level HTML components like divs or spans, depending on you know, the sh shape you would like to achieve. And uh, uh, there's nothing else you can do, okay? They are developing you know, the, the so-called uh, web components, but it's a standard that should still come, okay? Not yet finished, uh, uh, but at the moment there's no other alternative you know, to create uh, actual real web components, okay? They are, we have only have uh, HTML tags, okay? Uh, so how we define a component? We're very simple. Uh, we just define a function. So we write a function in JavaScript. The function may receive, and typically we receive properties, okay? That might simply ignored uh, or used, okay? As I told you before, th there's a component uh, for a film you pass as properties the values you would like to insert in the row for the film. Le the title, the favorite, the flag, the, the date, and stuff like that. Here a very simple component, uh, a post in a blog, 
Well, that's a div and a paragraph with the content, okay? And you can pass it through props. So props is an object. Everything we will see later is, is basically an object because props has a number of uh, uh, properties, okay? Or, or fields or however you would like to call them. And in short, you define which props you pass to your component and um, you can use those uh, values inside your component. And you see that uh, very simple component just have a single instruction return and it returns uh, what you should uh, show in the user interface in the form of HTML tags or you can also include other components, okay? You can nest the components, of course, okay? We will try this, the examples that we have in the last part of this set of slides. Uh, so there are basically two types of components. One is a presentational component like uh, the one we just saw before. So here it shows a content passed as a property. These are the very the simplest components because they don't need to manage the state. And the state is a bit difficult to manage. We will dedicate an entire lecture to manage the state in React. I mean, three hours to manage state. And then we talk about uh, again when, when we need. And while the container components, uh, so components that uh, should handle state, uh, of course, they are more difficult because this uh, state should be managed in some ways. Either it's a presentation state, so it's updated by user actions, so we need to, uh, uh, to capture events, uh, so these synthetic events like clicks and stuff from the user, or we need to interact with the backend. So it means the web server and the API server that provides us uh, the content, okay? So of course, if there's more code to write, it's more difficult to write, okay? Uh, so in short, uh, um, there's uh, the React application. The React application can be seen as a tree, a tree of components where we have simple components or more complex components. To each component, the parent component passes props, okay? And the state, uh, well, the state is late, okay? So uh, let's, let's focus on props. Uh, each component passes a set of props to the child, children components until you reach the leaves, so the end, the last component that basically renders only uh, native HTML components, div, span, uh, paragraph, uh, header, etc. Okay. Um, note that uh, as uh, uh, properties, we can also pass callbacks that can interact with the parent components because this way it seems that uh, you know everything is passed only from top to bot bottom, so from the root uh, towards the leaves. Okay, but remember that in JavaScript we can also pass uh, reference to functions and functions can act uh, on the parent components. So it will be important to handle states. Okay, so because the state are variables which are local to a certain component, we will come back to states when, when it's time. Okay, but um, you know, we, we just uh, need to know that also state values uh, can be passed by a component as property to children components, okay? So the state will be passed as an immutable value to the children and will be modified only if we pass functions that call something back in the parent to modify the state because the state is private to a certain component. Okay, it can be passed down, cannot be passed up, but can be passed down through the properties. Okay, but uh, we will see an example and these things will become uh, clearer. Okay, so this is the um, way in which uh, uh, React works in principle. So in short, uh, there is a state and a set of properties, okay? But typically we start from a state because properties at the root are, are set, are immutable, so they are constant, okay? And they are, they are created along the way when we move to the root, from the root to the child, children. And the state is passed to the view 
and the child components, so two components that needs to decide how to render things. Uh, this tree is solved by React, so it's updated, updates the virtual DOM that then you know creates some modification in the user interface in the in the browser window. And then and then we wait for some asynchronous action, either from the user, clicks or stuff, something you know, interaction by the user, typically clicks, but can be something else, mouse movement, depending on what, which events we capture, or uh, other asynchronous events that typically respond from API servers. So we ask for information and we wait for the answer. When answer from the server comes, it updates something in our in, in application, and so we will update the state and the cycle will restart. So updating the state, like updating the props, in React means that everything is re-rendered and the view is potentially modified, okay? And again, we will arrive at the view and then we will wait for a another asynchronous action. That's the way in which uh, any web application works. It renders in the beginning when you load the application and then it waits for asynchronous events coming from the user or from some other sources like the web server and so on, okay? Okay, I hope is, everything is clear. If you have questions, of course, just stop me, okay? Well, the state is always owned by own, uh, one single component. One means just one, okay? A single component is responsible for a certain state. There can be multiple states, of course. Um, Okay, this, this will be discussed better when we talk about uh, uh, state, okay? So let's try, okay? Tomorrow, I remember you, uh, uh, tomorrow you're still working on the, you know, old version of the lab, so still working with the fetch and cross-site scripting and stuff, but from next week in the lab, so on, on next Monday, uh, Tuesday, sorry, so not tomorrow, but in eight days, you will start uh, working with React and you will create your first React application as we are going to do it, uh, to do it now. So in short, uh, what is needed to use React? We need to import the React library. You remember that we saw import uh, one of the last lectures to import uh, packages. Libraries, uh, uh, React is distributed as a package, of course. Uh, actually, it's many packages because it's a complex uh, project, a complex library. Because we would like also to use this JSX, so we need to have this transpiler, so this translator, which is called Bubble. And we would like to use modules uh, and uh, have uh, everything compatible also for older browsers and stuff like that. So, in short, and also, uh, not, not least, uh, have uh, a, a, an easy development cycle, okay? We modify something and we would like to see the results immediately, okay? More or less like we did with Nodemon with the server, okay? We would like to have efficient development tools, okay? Because using a library, is, it's, it's done because we would like to have a more efficient development process, okay? So that's what you need to run, let's try. So you need to run a command in the terminal, like uh, very similar to the npm install. We don't use install. Here we use this, uh, this command. We give a name to our application. So from now on, we will have a project name. Okay, you need to choose one. And then uh, we will choose something from the menu, insert, uh, enter the directory, npm install. It will download a lot of stuff, okay? 74 megabytes of data, and then it will run a development server that will serve just our React application. So it's nothing to do with the API server that we've developed until now. At a certain point, we will merge the stuff, okay? But uh, it, it, it will take us three weeks, I think, to merge the things, because bef before merging things, we need to understand how React works uh, and being able to no, make calls towards the web server. Because if we are not able to, to make calls to the web server APIs, 
uh, the web server API is useless. Okay, so we will start working on the client part only for two, three weeks, uh, and then we will merge the things uh, and we will arrive at the full uh, React application. Okay, so just try to perform these steps. Okay, so oops, uh, just copy and paste. Okay, so let me try Visual Studio Code. Okay, uh, as usual, there's something that I've prepared uh, for later. But I open the terminal uh, in AW Wix uh, in Wix 7. Yes. So make things bigger. Oops. Yes. Fine. I just paste the command. Uh, I will use the my dash app name. You can use whatever name you like. Okay. So you see that uh, uh, you know a directory will be created. So just give a uh, uh, enter with the network connection, of course, because it needs to download stuff and so on. So it needs to install the create byte uh, package. Actually, that's a, a, a convenient package that they developed uh, just to, you know, uh, um, uh, run all the stuff uh, that needs to be installed for to create a, a React application. So we say yes, okay. And here we need to say what we would like to do. Uh, as the slide was saying, you know, from the menu choose React and then JavaScript, okay? This script uh, allows you to program in many other languages with many other things uh, and libraries. So we just choose React with the arrows, enter, and we will use uh, plain JavaScript, okay? Some of you may be may like TypeScript. Uh, we will not teach TypeScript in this uh, course, okay? But if you really cannot uh, do, uh, can, cannot uh, avoid using TypeScript, let's say it's kind of tolerated, but you are, on, you are on your own, okay? We cannot help you. And at the exam, you need to be able to explain what's happening, okay? TypeScript is very, is very similar to JavaScript, uh, okay? That's why we could also use TypeScript, but uh, you know, to simplify things, we stick to the basic JavaScript also because we don't have TypeScript in the browser. So we need to you know, show something in the browser. And so we just chose the basic version of JavaScript. Okay, so JavaScript, okay, done. Now run exactly what was uh, said in the slide. CD, my app, uh, install and so on. So cd my app okay uh, npm install and this will take uh, a little bit of time depending on the network connection and all this stuff if already downloaded stuff uh, can be already in the cache saved somewhere in your computer otherwise you just wait <laughs> okay and uh, uh, just have a look at the size it's 78 megabytes, okay. Not everything has been downloaded now. Something was in the cache because they already did some try in the office before coming to the lecture. But then uh, what we should do is, uh, what was in the slide, npm run dev, okay. Paste. So there's a web server running now. And there's a URL we can visit, okay, copy, and just paste it. That's a very basic uh, React application running, okay? This, uh, um, you know, this is a, a template uh, filled with something something nice, okay? So you use white <laughs> and they like uh, this stuff. This is a button, you can play a little bit, okay? But, it, but this is not just important, this is just a demo application, okay? And then we would like to program with our application. We'll go there, we'll see the files, we'll go into the app, we'll delete everything, and so we will delete the, all this stuff, and we will put our code, okay? But the important thing is that we have something 
from which we can start. Because developing React uh, uh, takes a lot of libraries uh, and so on. Okay, so let's see what happened. So let's uh, um, see this, uh, the file structure. So let me close what is not needed. Uh, just needed later. So in my app, oops, my app. Uh, this file structure. There's a lot of stuff, okay? React QA is just mine, okay? Don't, don't look at this. My app has basically created some um, uh, files, okay? The important stuff is, is inside I SRC. That's another folder. And here you find, uh, you know, the code that uh, was put here by the the script, okay? It's always the same, okay? It's not a surprise. Uh, you will always see, you know, this, this log and this button and this stuff. But you see that you 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 have this return uh, with HTML tags and all this stuff, okay? And basically, we will program inside here, okay? And um, so the rest, uh, we will not touch the rest, okay? We can create uh, files in SRC, of course. As the application grows, of course, we would like to divide our application into different files, but we, all, we already have a way to handle the files because we talked about modules. You can do import and all this stuff, okay? This is not Node.js, okay? This is a completely different stuff that's managed by the React library and the set of scripts. So basically, we can program more or less like if we are in the browser. So this code is sort of running in the browser, okay? I, I'm saying sort of because uh, it is, it is pre-processed and worked uh, by these uh, translators before uh, creating something that is passed to, to the browser, okay? But more or less, it's code that uh, runs into the browser. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. So we were able to create uh, the first uh, application. This is the folder structure, and in short, we have uh, this index HTML that we will not touch, uh, that loads uh, main, that loads app, okay? And in short, we develop into app, okay? And there you can write whatever you like. We can import other components. You can write your code. You can write your components. Uh, you know, import your files, etc. Okay. We will have a look at what's inside these files uh, just once, just once now in the lecture, and then we will forget. Okay, because we will always use this template. You would like to create a new React application? You rerun the script with a different name. A different folder is created, fine, and that's in a different application, okay? Or once you do it for your application, you develop in, 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 this, in, your, uh, in this SRC folder and you continue to, you know, uh, do your modification, your updates inside here. So let's have a look at what's inside the other two fi important files. So index.html. That's uh, what is served uh, by the web, uh, web um, server and seen by the web browser when we uh, do the npm run dev, okay? So that's a very simple web server, which is not express, uh, basic simple, very simple stuff because it just needs to serve static files, okay? And this is the document, the HTML document that is served and you recognize, you know, this uh, body, of course, div id root and a script type module that loads your application. Actually, that's main, and main does this create root doco document get element by id root render app. App is the root of your uh, components, okay? and corresponds to the file in which we will develop our stuff, okay? So in short, we have seen uh, exactly what we were talking about in the beginning. So this stuff, 
the stuff has been done for us, okay? So there's an HTML document that has an ID root. It does get element by ID, creates root, uh, render, not this simple stuff, but uh, main that uh, renders up, okay? Fine. So uh, we will have to write something here into up, okay? Good. Uh, let's try to play a little bit. Yes, we have a bit of time. Okay, we'll break it usual, as usual after one hour and a half. But uh, uh, let's play a little bit, okay? Because uh, I explained you all the theory, but then when you are in the lab, you need to start your project. So you will do exactly as I did, uh, uh, what I did now. You create your application, you call it whatever you like, films uh, or film uh, library, whatever you want. And then you start to organize your content into components, okay? Let's try to create a very, very, very simple application, okay? So we'll try to take this code and put into app and see if it works. That's exactly what you will do uh, in the library, in, sorry, yeah, for, for the film library, but in the lab, okay? So uh, I think I have, I could cut and paste from the slide, but uh, I should have this code already uh, ready for me in some other folder, if I remember where, where I put it. Uh, examples, yes. I think it's uh, uh, example button, yes, this stuff, okay? That's exactly the stuff that you have on the slides, okay? Just, uh, I, I put it separately just because when I do cut and paste from the slides, there's always something not working, you know, uh, enters, uh, new lines, and stuff like that, okay? But, um, I mean, exactly what is in the slides. And I go, I go here in up, okay? And in short, I, oops, I just go and delete everything, almost everything, okay? So... Let's see. Okay. O I say almost everything. Why? Because, uh, oops. You see at the end, there's this export default app. I shouldn't delete it. Because this export app for the main that then takes it uh, and uh, put it into the root of the HTML. Okay? So this is a module. App JSX, it's a module. Okay, so it needs to export something, but we need not to touch this stuff. We just basically write into app and we write components if we need components. Okay, for the moment we write them in the same file because it's easier. And we just delete all the imports. Uh, no, no, it's better not to delete all the imports because we need to. Yeah, so we should be able to delete all the imports. Okay, so um, okay, uh, I've saved the, the file, okay, and you see something has changed, okay, not so nice, I agree with you, but now we will fix it, okay, but you see that something has changed, okay, so the, co the HTML content is always the same because everything is created dynamically, okay? It's created by the JavaScript code, okay? So, in short, uh, you know, what is uh, put here uh, below root is created by the, by the JavaScript code, by the React JavaScript code, okay? And in particular, by what I wrote inside the app, okay? And inside up, you see that I have this paragraph, press here, button, ciao, that is Italian for hello. Okay, so let's see. Uh, you know, paragraph, press here, and there's this button that's a way to create a component in uh, React. And uh, it simply decides if we would like to create a button with the text ciao or hello depending on the value of a prop, okay? And this prop is passed 
with a name that I decided at a certain value that I decided, okay? So, of course, this example is very guided. I mean, I'm telling you what to do, and, but at the end of the lecture, hopefully, you will be able to, uh, you know, do it yourself with your uh, uh, code, with your application, in particular with the one with the lab. Okay, so first of all, note that uh, I just saved the, the file and everything was reloaded automatically. Okay, so if I change something, let's say just an enter. Now I save, and you see uh, it automatically reloads the content because it's like the node mon. Okay, it monitors the file if you change something. Okay, uh, it automatically reloads here, and also there's a part that runs into the browser in the browser within the browser that automatically reloads the page, the browser page as well. Okay, this is not always working. Sometimes you have to stop it and reload <laughs> everything. Okay, because uh, you know more fundamental things need to have the browser reload the full application, but for small stuff it typically works. Okay, so this is why it it uh, um, simplifies the development. You modify stuff and you immediately see the result, okay? Um, so let's do like this. So, so let's make the, you know, the browser on the left side and the Visual Studio Code on the right side. So imme you immediately see the effect, okay? We reduce the size a little bit. I hope it's still readable. It's especially in the recording, okay? So you see, now we change a value of a prop, okay? And, okay, to say English, we save it, uh, look at the left part. Uh, oops, um, I would like to save it to show you. You see, now the same component, which is actually button, renders using the second part and not the first part because the if is executed it says enter in the else part and it renders button hello and not button ciao which is the italian for hello okay so this is a very very simple example just one component just one property but you see that when a property changes React takes care of rerunning the components for which the properties have been changed, like the button here, rerun this code, take the result, and, and put the result inside the virtual DOM that then updates the actual DOM, and so the appearance in the window is changed, okay? This is just a simple text that changes, nothing really difficult to understand, okay? But this is the basic principle on which React works, okay? Uh, one more thing, this is more practical. Uh, why this stuff is rendered in the middle of the window, not on the top, on the left, <laughs> etc. okay? That's because uh, there's a lot of CSS uh, running inside this very simple example, okay? I invite you to do this thing, so go into app CSS, Select all, uh, that's no select all, well, select uh, all, and delete everything, and save, okay? And then do the same for index CSS, select all, and uh, delete, uh, and save, okay? Because they, they give you a very complex CSS, uh, you know, to format stuff for their example. If you have your own CSS, you don't want to have interference from, you know, that uh, template, okay? If you have your CSS, a good place to put is app CSS, okay? We'd like to have, uh, I don't know, font, uh, uh, let's define a class uh, text. Uh, font color, whatever, font, uh, no, not uh, font size, I don't know, to RAM, okay? And we use it, uh, uh, let's see, 
hello press here with uh, p class name uh, what should we say text right text okay save okay this is your CSS you can do whatever you want with your CSS but at least it's your CSS you know what you are doing okay and there's no interference uh, with a very complex CSS that was written for that example okay you can also import bootstrap and all the stuff we will see it uh, later okay so just uh, remove this uh, stuff okay and so we go back to the usual situation okay uh, of course you can stop the server control C in the terminal as you typically do you know with node mon and all this stuff uh, npm run dev just rerun the server and you need to well yeah either reload the page or make it make it reload um, okay fine so we experimented with a very simple example first example first react example that we had on the slide okay um, let me see yes we still have time to to run uh, another example so you can of course program by you know moving your code in other files you just need to import uh, the stuff as you did the last time with the import okay we typically call these files jsx not js just to remember the fact that inside there's uh, also jsx code that means uh, writing this uh, xml uh, um, content that is then translated by the this bubble to into uh, javascript code automatically okay uh, so i think uh, I, I would leave this example for you okay uh, just separate uh, create a new file and you know move the stuff of the button in the new file and, and put the import in the old and it should work as exactly as before uh, let's have a look at something more interesting this is just an example this uses a state as i told you we will spend at least three hours talking about states in react so now we just take it for granted but at least we see something okay <laughs> um, so let's use a dynamic state inside the button so in short the button remembers something remember information in particular remembers the language in which it displays information um, so again I have this example hopefully available in this examples uh, example button state yes copy I will substitute the old button here okay it's just taken from the slides okay no uh, nothing really different from what you have seen in the slides okay just you know having the big fonts don't help that much anyway uh, now I save okay the web server reloads the file and just let's see the appearance okay actually the appearance is exactly as before I'm not sure if we should use yeah props lang ang. okay so it starts in English let's press the button you see what happens when we press the button okay so we press the button it changes the language so let's see what happens using the uh, uh, extension that we installed before you see the components tab that comes with the react extension you see uh, here no unfortunately it doesn't no uh, i cannot uh, make it larger but there's uh, up and there's button here okay so that's the hierarchy of the components okay we have just two components up which is always the root and uh, button which is under up nested in up okay but important 
uh, why it doesn't it used to to be bigger but uh, um, yeah I, I see if during the uh, the break I can make it bigger anyway if you go to but into button you will see props okay so the list of props and the list of the state state n if I click it will come state it okay so I mean it's not really important what we are we are seeing here it's just that uh, we have a tool to inspect what's happening inside the components of react okay so if you have a doubt about uh, what's the state what's the current value of the state or the properties and so on you can go around and uh, look at the values so it's a sort of a debugger for props and state of react components and also for the uh, um, structure the the tree of the react components okay oh, it's very handy sometimes especially in the beginning okay um okay so let's come to the last example you learned uh, to use bootstrap during the lab right we don't want to try to throw bootstrap out of the window because it's very useful uh, to you know have a sort of nice formatting okay a nice appearance of our web page yes Ah, the function use state creates a state uh, uh, in react so that's a topic for the three hours lecture so in short it gives uh, us uh, two two values one is the value which actually contains the state and the second is a function that we should use to modify the state we are not allowed to modify the state directly but we should always call this function to modify the state okay so let me make it bigger but we will come back to this stuff uh, when we talk about state because of course it's really really crucial for for react uh, we cannot just say this is a state in react in state we need to create it and to create it we need use state from the react library that allows us to create a state okay and there uh, and then you have this value this uh, this variable in short that you can use within the component it has a value as the other properties it cannot be modified directly if we would like to modify it we need to use this the function passed so like the set button lang okay but we can modify the value of the state and this automatically changes uh, the state and the appearance because react takes care of updating the appearance okay okay so thank you for the lab uh, for the question and i'm sorry that i was probably too quick in showing this example so let's see the last example that is adding bootstrap okay so um, yeah either this way or uh, yeah this way so uh, to use bootstrap well in react that's very simple uh, you just import the CSS okay but you need to install the corresponding package let's see what happens when I import something that doesn't exist okay so save you see the error and you you go and see you see import bootstrap etc error uh, I don't know what it says at a certain point hopefully it says a uh, file not found yeah does the file exist okay no it doesn't exist so let's control C let's stop the server npm install okay you can install both bootstrap and a library that uh, allows you to use bootstrap uh, elements directly created in the form of react components so let's first install bootstrap bootstrap okay okay now we rerun the web server and now the web server at least starts uh, but you see the appearance is not that nice right that's a standard button of the browser it's not rounded and you know all the fancy thing that bootstrap has why because this is just a normal button okay either we apply a class class name button button primary that's one thing that we could do 
uh, but uh, I suggest you to try to use as much as possible this React Bootstrap package that basically takes the Bootstrap, uh, uh, let's say, formatting styles and gives you elements, components already designed and working well within the React environment that you can use in your application directly. Okay? So uh, let's take this, uh, um, yeah, this example. So uh, the second one, okay? So the button, let's just take the button and then you can create uh, also the layout with the co uh, container, column, uh, row, row columns and all the stuff, okay? As in the previous slide. But uh, let's just play with the button. So we have the button here. So button, okay, React Bootstrap, let's save it. Again, error, why? Because it's something that we need to install. So React dash Bootstrap, okay. The semicolon is just okay for the shell, <laughs> I forgot it. Okay, and now at least, it, no, it doesn't start, why? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, it, do, it doesn't start because, you know, button is imported, but uh, we also call it our function button, unfortunately. Okay. So let's um, reformat this stuff a little bit. So my button, this is my button. This is a name that we, I chose for my component. And instead of using the button, the HTML button, we use the B button that we imported by React Bootstrap, okay? Here we chose, uh, uh, actually no, we didn't choose the name, we didn't choose the name because uh, React Bootstrap chose it for us, okay? But they are typically mapped the one-to-one -to, -one to the HTML component, uh, HTML elements. But they made informal components and as you already saw, uh, you know, it's very, uh, typical of React of writing components with the first letter uppercase, okay? Like up, you see, first letter uppercase, my button, first letter uppercase, and what I'm importing from React Bootstrap, first letter uppercase. That's just a convention, but again, very useful because you don't mix up, uh, you know, basic HTML elements and components, React components. Okay. So let's save it and start again. Okay, no, there's still something not working. What's, uh, ah, yeah, I need to, of course, this is XML, <laughs> okay? The, br the, the translator is not uh, really tolerant uh, to these errors. Everything should be perfectly nested, perfectly closed and so on. If I open a, a component, which is the, a certain component has a certain name, I need to close that name, of course. Okay, so save, uh, stop, and run again. Okay, now it works. Uh, let's see the appearance. Okay, you can also reload the stuff. And you see the typical uh, boost, bootstrap button appearance. Okay, you just need to get used to this, uh, this stuff. Okay, and, and you can use uh, all the styles that you learned in Bootstrap, just uh, you need to search a little bit because uh, you typically don't use class name, etc., but you use uh, attributes which are mapped to properties because these are React components. Uh, like uh, there's the variant that was, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of implicit in the bootstrap, uh, plain bootstrap. Uh, secondary, so we, we change the color. Okay, just one of them, so we don't need to rush. You see, it goes uh, uh, gray, because the secondary style was gray, and the primary style, which is also the default, uh, is blue. Okay? And you play a little bit, and you can, uh, um, you know, see what happens uh, with very simple ex this very simple example. 
So I think we can break here. If you don't have questions, I commit the example in the, during the break, so you have it. But it's a very simple example. Of course, remember, I never commit the mod node modules, okay? Also, there's a git ignore that says node modules should never be committed. There are 74 megabytes of useless stuff because the package manager is able to reconstruct everything from scratch and mm, it just, you know, exchanges libraries that are not uh, needed, okay? Uh, okay, so let's break 10 minutes or something like this, and then we will continue discussing. Oh, we have a guest. <laughs> just be careful, okay? That's a pigeon. <laughs> okay, let's break. <laughs>